There are no sponsors. The people who keep it going are those of us who watch it. It means taking a little money out of our pockets, but it's a small price to pay, really. Welcome back to the next segment of our interview with Howard Zinn. Thank you, Howard. Glad to be here. While there's a fairly seems dramatic division in many domestic questions between Obama and McCain, although not so much when it came to the bailout, but certain on other, other questions, health care and some other issues, um, there hasn't been a heck of a lot of difference on foreign policy. And, and that's generally the American tradition, that the Democrats and Republicans, with some small exceptions, are all, mostly on the same page. Um, why is that, and, and, and might we see any change in that? The history of the United States is a history of expansion. That's sort of fundamental to uh, what the United States has been from the very beginning. From the very end of the Revolutionary War, the nation began expanding westward. And everybody was caught up in that. Republicans, Democrats, liberals, conservatives. Thomas Jefferson, who was an opponent of big governments and, and presumably of expansion, uh, doubled the size of the country by the Louisiana Purchase. And uh, so uh, the country expanded westward and southward, southward through the Mexican War, westward through exterminating Indians, really. Uh, and. Uh, destroying their, their civilizations, and then into the Caribbean, and then into the Pacific. And uh, yes, Republican and Democratic administrations both participated in this, because in all cases they were driven by economic motives. Uh, Polk was a Democrat when we went to the Mexican War, but he still was driven by the desire for more land. Uh, McKinley, a Republican during the Philippine War, uh, driven by the, the riches he saw in the Philippines, and and in Asia. Uh, in the Vietnam War, we had a succession of Democratic and Republican presidents all pursuing uh, victory in Vietnam, all pursuing the idea of planting American base in, in Vietnam. And why? Because of the, as they confided to one another in their inter-office memos, because they were interested in tin, rubber, and oil of Southeast Asia, and Vietnam was a, a nice base for guarding all of that. So, yes, Republican and Democratic administrations have been as one. And it was, after all, it was Jimmy Carter, presumably a sort of liberal Democrat, who declared a Carter doctrine, uh, saying, well, we're prepared to use force to any extent in order to control the oil of the Middle East. So uh, I'm not surprised that Obama, the Democratic candidate, has not uh, departed uh, in any really serious way from the militarist idea of American power in the world. Because even though he calls for the reduction of American forces in Iraq, and it's only a reduction, he doesn't really talk about the complete withdrawal of American forces, at the same time he calls for sending more troops to Afghanistan. And at the same time he talks about increasing our armed forces and maintaining a large military budget. So this is a disheartening thing about the American political system that both major parties uh, have in common an imperial quest for more power. And this, I think, bears on the presidential campaign because what it does is to limit Obama in what he can say about domestic policy. Because if, he, if Obama is really going to give everybody health care, and he hasn't made that clear at all. If he really is going to make sure everybody has jobs, if he really is going to use government resources to take care of everybody in a decent way, the only way he can find this money to do this is by reducing the military budget. We're spending $600 billion this year on the military. And uh, it will take a bold move to reduce the military. Now, that means a bold change in American foreign policy. 
Because so long as you have, as we have now, military bases in over a hundred countries in the world, I wonder how many Americans have taken that into consideration when they think of us as a peaceful, peace-loving, gentle nation, that we have military bases in a hundred countries in the world. So long as we have military bases in a hundred countries, we have a huge expense in sustaining these military bases. In the election campaign, the only one that really talked about that with any seriousness was Ron Paul. Yes. I mean, you didn't really hear it on any, from yeah. all, I guess Nader talks about it a bit, but uh, yes. maybe Kucinich, but the real spokesperson yeah, Kucinich, on this. Kucinich has always raised, yeah. raised that question. It's interesting, the people who raise that question are people who are kept at the margin of the political system. Ron Paul, Kucinich, Nader. Well, I guess the only thing that's more sacrilegious uh, than ta talking about taxes is talking about redu reductions in the military. That's right, and yet, polls, public opinion polls that have been taken over the decades have shown that the American people are not as militaristic as our leaders. That the American people have been willing to cut the military budget, especially if you align that with more money for health, education, uh, clean up the environment. Amer if, when the American people are given no choice, and they just ask, do you think we should have a strong military? Oh yes, everybody thinks we should have a strong military. But when you ask them, what would you rather have? More money for the military or more money for education and health? The answer in all these polls has always been the same. And the, and the Democratic Party has not taken advantage of that. Now we haven't heard uh, really a word from Obama on, on any kind of reduction of the military budget. In fact, if anything, he's talked about adding troops yes. to the army. Yes. Um, and, and, and he ha I mean, one, it's not clear he wants to do it, and if mm. he does want to do it, uh, can he do it without having ceded it to some extent in the election campaign? And people will say he has no mandate to do it if he hasn't talked about it. Well, once you become president, uh, <laughs> you can do what you want, as Bush has shown us. He has a lot of experience Yes, that, yeah. so long as you can persuade the American people that you're doing the right thing. And I think that you can easily persuade the American people that the wealth of the country should be used to, to create a decent society here at home. Let's assume Obama does get elected mm -hmm. and, and you get a phone call. It, it seems these calls only can come at three in the morning if they mm -hmm. have to do with foreign policy. And uh, so uh, it's Barack and he says, well, Howard, what do you think a rational foreign policy would be? Hmm. What would be your, what, what are some very specific things you would suggest to him? Well, the specific things I would suggest yeah, would be to uh, withdraw our military bases from other countries, withdraw our aircraft carriers from uh, seas that are not immediately around the United States. Uh, but in, in order to do those specific things, you have to have a larger objective in mind. You have to have a larger philosophical decision that you've made. And the larger decision that you have to make, President Obama, the larger decision you have to make is that, and this is a tough one, but you have to think about this, that we are not going to engage in aggressive wars anymore. Uh, once you make that decision, then you immediately free up huge sums of money to take care of real problems for us and for other people in the world. Make up your mind that we are no longer going to be a military superpower. We'll be a humanitarian superpower. Uh, we'll still be strong, we'll still, we'll still be wealthy, uh, but we are not going to use our strength and we're not going to waste our wealth in military actions because, and I think history bears this out, War is no longer viable as a way of solving problems in the world. I mean, if, if you look at Iraq and Afghanistan, here we are, the most powerful country in the world, and we cannot win a war in Iraq or win a war in Afghanistan. The Russians, powerful as they were, could not win a war in Afghanistan. Uh, now, this is from a pragmatic point of view, do you win? But the question is, what is accomplished in war? And the answer that we have ever since World War II is you don't really change the world in a good direction 
with war. In the next segment of our interview, let's talk about where did this idea come that America is the beacon of freedom on the hill? <laughs> and can Americans give up on that idea? Because mm. it sure isn't just from just Republicans that believe in that. There's no, lots, of, lots of Democrats that That's believe true. in that. Please join us for the next segment of our interview with Howard Zinn. Donate today and receive a new documentary film available to members of the Real News Network. The History of the National Security State with legendary author Gore Vidal. Bonus features of the DVD include an in-depth response to Vidal from ex-CIA analyst Ray McGovern, who served under seven U.S. presidents, an exclusive interview with Colin Powell's former chief of staff Larry Wilkerson, and an insightful interview with oil policy analyst Antonia Juhasz. News magazine of the screen. Living glimpses of history in the making. Hollywood and Washington, there's a symbiotic relationship. They both deal with illusions. Reality doesn't often uh, play much of a part. I think I saw through the myth of the uh, Cold War almost from the beginning. I was a Washington political kid from a political family. Roosevelt first had radio because he had a, this great speaking voice that everyone liked to hear. Truman proceeded to break every arrangement that Roosevelt had set up for a peaceful coexistence. And Truman thought that it would be a good idea. Why not just stay armed all the time? And then he devised the national security state. You've got to go up and swear allegiance to the United States or else you're a commie. I mean, we, were, we had imported fascism. We get Dwight Eisenhower, who said that we have this great military industrial complex. It is a dangerous thing. And he said, this is going to change everything. And the way our country is governed, it's going to change us politically. Along comes Jack Kennedy, who wanted to make his mark, believed in the Cold War. But he said, in this kind of politics, it is the appearance of things that matters. I think everybody should take a sober look at the world about us. The national security state still exists, only it isn't communism anymore, it's terrorism. This is the most serious thing that has happened in the history of the United States. Knowledge is power. We need an honest new system. We need the real news. This is the sort of thing we can build right now without anyone else's permission from the government or from the business community. It's the powers in our hands. If we're not gonna sleepwalk into more wars, we think we need to start with a television news network that won't bow to pressure and has the courage to seek facts. And that means independent economics. And that's why we need you. Make a tax-deductible donation now of at least $10 a month or a one-time give of at least $75. As a thank you for your support, we will send you the new documentary film, The History of the National Security State. 